Hi everybody, it's Neil here. I'm here to talk about the latest Ambly House video. Which one was that, you may ask? It was uh, a live compilation of Till There Was You, like multiple different live things. The bass part, though, is mainly compiled from the Ed Sullivan Show, the February 9th, 1964 Ed Sullivan Show, where the Beatles played to 70 million people and changed history and all that jazz. There's a few things I want to talk about in this. I want to talk about sort of the evolution and musicality of Paul's bass lines from early to late, and I'm going to use this as an example. But first, I want to talk about tone. Everyone always asks me about tone, the Hoffner tone specifically. I get so many comments. How do you recommend I get Paul's Hoffner bass tone? Well, the they always ask me that. You guys always ask me that. It's a favorite question of yours. And I like answering it. I'm going to keep answering it every video as much as I can from what I've discovered so far. A really good, easy way to start is to have some sort of Hoffner bass or Hoffner bass-like thing, any sort of hollow-bodied violin short-scale bass thing. It's a good start. Uh, then flat on strings are the second good place to start. I have my favorites. Other people have their favorites as well. These are Tomastic Infeld flat one strings. They're just super musical strings. I really, really like them. They're sort of more low tension-y. can be a little more musical with them. Some people like labellas. Labellas aren't my favorite, but they are a really nice string. You know, like they're really smooth and they're dark, which is, I think, nice. Uh, there's pyramids, which is, I think, what Paul actually was supposedly playing back in the day. Um, I don't know. Honestly, any flat one string is going to work on this. Uh, if you do the other two steps that come next. Okay, so let's say you get a Hoffner bass or a Hoffner bass-like thing. You put flat wound or flat wound-like strings on it. Uh, the next thing I recommend you do is raise your action nice and high. I always try to show here. Ah, that's too difficult. I'll take a picture and we'll edit it in here. Uh, I have very high action on this bass. It used to be higher when I had more tense strings on it, actually. Uh, it's a little hard to play at first, but you, you get used to it, and it's good. It's a good exercise for your hand. Um, but what that allows you to do is it allows you to kind of articulate a little bit more. Staccato versus legato, and uh, sliding and pull-offs and all this kind of stuff. And it just, you can get a thumpier tone out of it. You can kind of just really smack the string and go out of it, you know. That's a really good place to start, and that does add a lot to your tone, you know, like it can't be too close to the thing, it can't be too bink, 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 it's gonna be boom, boom, boom. Okay, and that comes to now the actual EQ of it. People always ask for amp settings and whatnot. Um, I tend to find when other people are, are playing Hoffners, they, they make it way too clicky. Most of the time, it's a very round bass sound, you know. You know, there might be a little mid on it, or like very little highs. So honestly, when I'm trying, when I'm mixing some of the songs, I almost sometimes tend to cut everything above three to four hundred k. And uh, and then other songs like it won't be long. It's a little bit of a more of a boom, go, 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 you know. And I, maybe I'll keep seven. I'll cut everything above seven hundred, you know. But in general, it's a very round boom, 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 you know. It, most of the songs kind of sound like this to me. Just... You know, it has that sort of sound to it. All right, so that's my Hoffner Beetle Tone advice to you is raise your action, cut some treble, and try to thump it. Try to thump it, baby. Now I'd like to discuss early bass lines versus late bass lines and kind of what the difference in all that is. Uh, let's start with kind of what, in my mind, musically, when I'm separating early Beatles versus late Beatles. Especially in these musical contexts, I'm thinking of uh, early Beatles being they, they wrote and recorded a song that they were expecting to play in front of an audience. And then late Beatles is when they, they either don't care about that or they, they don't even plan on playing it. It's literally just a studio recording. You know, so uh, what I found when I first was starting to get into doing Paul stuff professionally, 
I it was you know I knew the bass lines relatively well from just knowing the songs my whole life. But I I was like okay I should sit down with these and start learning them as as best I can. It was the first deep dive I ever did about about ten years ago. I found myself trying harder to get things note for note on later songs than earlier songs. And it wasn't me disrespecting earlier songs. I recognize that a lot of later Paul bass lines are compositions of, uh, of you know, in themselves. With a little help from my friends is a great example of it, of that, of it just being a composed bass line. And even Jeff Emmerich said they literally went phrase by phrase. Paul sat in the control booth and they went phrase by phrase and then they would stop and Paul would say, okay, let me come up with something for this. He'd play the next phrase and then, okay, stop. Let me, let me come up with something with this. You know, it was, he was literally composing each section of the song and he was trying to make it different and vary it. Uh, early songs, you can tell, obviously he's going for a theme and a goal and whatnot, but he's just, they're just playing. They're just jamming, you know. Songs like Roll Over Beethoven are a good example of that, you know. He's kind of just playing arpeggios, but every take is going to be different. It's not like a set. It's not like every note in the song is purposeful and thought out. It's just, he's playing, you know, which is awesome. That's why the spirit of early Beatles is great. It's because it's a live band in their element in the recording studio. But something I'd like to note, and I'm going to use this version of Tiller's You to show you what I mean, is that Paul always played to the room and always played to the scenario. And that's really, really important. And a lot of people, especially people who get into playing Beatles stuff, have a hard time separating that. But that's an important thing that Paul did. If you listen to what he did on the BBC or what he did here, you know, he was gonna play whatever sounded best in a ballroom and was gonna match the energy of the audience in that ballroom too, or whatever. Whatever sounded best in the Ed Sullivan Show. Whatever sounded best at the Hollywood Bowl, you know? I'm going to tell you what I mean right now. So if you look at the record version of Tiller is You, I'm not sure if he's using a pick or his fingers, but on the Ed Sullivan Show, he starts off with his fingers. And Paul does this throughout his career. When he wants a more rounder, not aggressive-y bass sound, um, something more stand-up bass-like, he takes his fingers and he plucks on the neck. There's a bunch of pictures of him doing it. does it in the I'm Wars video. There's a picture of him recording with his jeans unbuttoned at Abbey Road and the Rick, and he's, you know... Uh, and he kind of is doing a more, not syncopated, but rhythmic pattern on the bass. Now, let's, let's look at what the bass stands in this song. There's a lot of songs we've done where I feel like the bass really ties everything together. This song, the bass, is the single biggest supporting role in this song. It's just adding low-end root notes to the chords. That's it. Just bottom-end space to everything. This song is mainly about sort of kind of a salsa rhythm with Paul's pretty vocal on top of it. That's the main point of the song, you know? And, uh, and, and when he's playing, even on the record, he's not doing anything that fancy, but he does a couple fancy things. So you can tell in the Ed Sullivan Show, he starts off going. You know, he starts off doing that, and then almost immediately, you can see him switch to his pick. And he starts, he starts doing that. Now, you, you can tell it's kind of like, screw this. Like, he wants to go be as cute as he is on the record with the bass. But then, look at the Ed Sullivan stage. Their amps were facing them off off the wings, who <laughs> how far away, who knows. There's no real PA system. There's hundreds of screaming fans in the audience. The second he started doing this, he could tell that there wasn't enough oomph. And so he just immediately switches back to a pick. And he probably wants to feel comfortable. He doesn't want to concentrate on other things. And then here's another thing he does. Right in the second verse, he starts just doing everything quarter notes. He kind of abandons the cutesy pine rhythms. He he just keeps it simple. And a lot of times you see Beatles do this too, once again, because of the monitoring situation. Uh, Ringo a lot of times just kind of is keeping the beat live. 65, 66 especially. Just, they're just trying to stay in time with each other because... They don't, you know, they can't really hear that great. And everything he plays in the Ed Sullivan show uh, it isn't really syncopated. It's kind of like just, it's all all my loving, and I saw her standing there, and I want to hold your hand. It's all eighth and quarter note stuff, you know. <clears throat> but he recognizes, he recognizes that the most important thing in that song is the vocal, and he's just keeping the pulse going with the bass and trying to stay out of the way of, of everyone, just having there be a boomy, boom, 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 
Boom, boom, boom, boom. Because there's a couple cool things he does on the record that he doesn't do here. I'll show you a couple licks I like on the record. Um, he goes, and there was music and wonderful roses. They tell me. He does this thing on the D where he goes. He like goes up and on the one five one D D A D in the solo he does something very cool coming out of the A minor walking out of G minor thing. Uh, do do. First of all, he does he does a different rhythm there. I think that's very cool. He does G, and then he plays F sharp over C sharp. And kind of this very syncopated rhythm to a quick C, resolving down that five, back to the one. And that goes back into the bridge. But you know, he wasn't going to do anything fancy like that, the second song in of Ed Sullivan. And I think that's smart. It's fine. Play to the room, play to the strength of the song, help your bandmates out. Do all that stuff. Match the energy of the room. All that. There's more to learn from the Beatles than just parts of songs. It's why they did those parts. Why those parts work well. Why they do what they do in certain situations live versus why they don't do them, you know. Uh, and I think this is a very good example of that. And there's nothing wrong with Paul dumbing it down live there a little bit. Like, it doesn't need a fancy bass line. The mix isn't great anyway. Uh... But yeah, so I wanted to, to illustrate that point. And it's not. This, this bass line is not with a little help from my friends. It doesn't carry the song. It just needs to be root notes of the chords. And that's it. All right, everyone. That's it for me today. I'm sure I'll see you around for some other videos in the future. I don't think I have a sign-off line yet. Maybe I should come up with one. Regardless, why don't you leave a comment like, subscribe to us and all that. If you have any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, if you see Neil Candelora respond, that's me. I'm responding. That's me responding to you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's it. That's the one, you know. Oh yeah.